Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm a PO at University of Leicester Archaeological Services, and this presentation was actually originally done for the Royal Town Planning Institute, and so originally had a developer and non-archaeological planners audience in mind, but I've tweaked it a bit to bring it back into WSIs. But really, I want we've heard a lot of detail about what should go into WSIs, and I want to step back from that and look at more broadly at project design and hopefully start a thought process about perhaps where WSIs should appear within the design process. Um, should they appear where they do now, or should we be considering them much earlier on? And in that case, should we be thinking about what actually goes into them. This is very much a contractor's perspective as well, because I've never been anything else other than a contractor. It's very much a Leicester perspective, because pretty much I spent my entire career digging up Leicester rather than anywhere else as well. So urban archaeology then, we can all agree, is lengthy, it's complicated, it's costly, it can be prohibitive to development if it's handled poorly. And so we need to be finding a good compromise then between um, appropriate and effective and meaningful mitigation from an early stage. So that then comes down to the project design process and the WSI is obviously a key part of that. It should obviously, that project design, follow an industry standard, but as we've already mentioned, as Matt said, it needs to be flexible, it needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis. It needs to have the capacity to react to changes in the design as because the development is not static, it does evolve through the planning process. It should be an early conversation. It's got to be pre-application, I, I feel generally. It's, um, or at least the start of it has got to be before you see it coming as a condition within a planning application. And it should be collaborative, and we've had that uh, several times today already as well. You can't just have one organisation or one group writing it. You've got to feed in information from all aspects of that project, that development. So pretty standard planning application. This is a recent one for Leicester, for Leicester Cathedral, in fact. And condition two there is the standard Leicester City um, archaeological condition, and it mentions the WSI four times in that. But generally, this is where we start seeing the need for the WSI. It comes through as the legal condition in the planning application. But at this point, the project is already very well developed because they've got to the point where they can put their application in for planning permission. So the building at this point, in theory, has already been designed. And until we've had um, we don't know at this point then how much archaeological input has gone into that design to help mitigate the archaeology underneath it, but also make it a better building as well, potentially. And too many times have I turned up on site and done the work, been doing the work and the contractor has gone, oh, I didn't know that was there. And it was like, well, did you bother to send anyone out to look in the trial trenching? We could have shown you exactly what the ground level was like. How many times have we all been on site where the developer has turned up and go, I didn't realise you were going to dig out the ground. We've all had levels are now off. And it's like, well, do you even know what archaeology is? <laughs> we all have stories like that, I'm sure. <laughs> now, Leicester is probably one of the most excavated cities in the country at this point. We've excavated 15% of the historic core now. So we are, over the last 100 years, we've done a lot of excavation in Leicester. We've got a very good understanding of how, and I mean us collectively and all the archaeological bodies involved in Leicester in this point, um, we have a very good understanding of, of how complex the problem is likely to be for development. And we get different reactions from the developers to that. And generally, we find we have better relationships working with local developers than external developers, because local developers also have that sense of understanding of what the city is. And I want to take you through two case studies, um, two different sites, one carried out in 2015, which went horribly wrong um, for the developer, and one, and the archaeology, and one that went really well in 2016. Um, a couple of... Um, caveats to this as well. ULAS stepped in at the last minute in the 2015 one. It had multiple archaeological units and consultants involved in it, and we stepped in to after it went off the rails to, to carry out the final aspect of it. We carried out the 2016 one from beginning to end, and these projects also had a change of city archaeologists between them. So one city archaeologist was involved with one, and a different one was involved with the other one. Um, 
as well. So given that we know we're digging in Leicester, we know we're in an area of archaeological significance because of that extensive amount of work we've already done. So the former Southgate's bus depot then was within the walled Roman and medieval town. It had known Roman sites in the vicinity um, from little bits of field work. It was adjacent to the medieval high street and to Greyfriars, so where Richard III was buried, so the, the um, um, Franciscan friary. But largely its potential was unknown because it's in an area of the city we don't get to do much excavation in because it's the sort of historic quarter of the city. The former All Saints Brewery site then, it's also within the walled area of the town. It's adjacent to the main Roman and medieval streets through the town leading to the town's north gate. It's got significant Roman sites known in its immediate vicinity and historical records tell us St John's Hospital stood, the 12th century hospital, stood somewhere most likely on the site as well. So both sites from the outset had a strong likelihood of finding significant archaeology and so they should be being built, that archaeology should be being built into the project from its uh, each development from its inception. A little bit of history about the two different sites then. So the Southgate's bus depot, it had its historic frontages demolished in the 1920s to re and replaced by the bus depot. That bus depot operated until 2009 when it was shut and then it was demolished in 2011. And that's when the, that project, the, the development project began effectively. So it had a fairly standard um, program of work. So it was, had a desk-based assessment in early 2010 that identified potential extensive um, buried archaeology. It had um, permission to knock the bus depot down in later 2010 and then with conditions on that then required archaeological watching brief for the demolition and trial trenching after the demolition to start identifying the archaeological potential of the site. A couple of years later then, and this was a long drawn out project, finally they put a planning application in and it was granted with archaeological conditions for more work and for the requirement of an archaeological impact statement on the site as well. Another couple of years passed before the impact statement was finally submitted. Um, that suggested the archaeology, based on the trial trenching, that the archaeology was over two metres below the ground and that the proposed development would only impact 1.2% um, of the site. That then led to a watching brief, unbelievably starting, on the project, rather than any further archaeological excavation. And then on the 29th of July 2015, a meeting between the city archaeologist and the archaeological consultancy on the site as the watching brief started had identified that actually the archaeology was less than 80 centimetres below the ground and that the true scale of the impact of the development on the site was 5.3 and within each building footprint was as high as 15%. And at that point, the piling rigs were on site and no archaeological mitigation had been done. That caused a stop order and the requirement for more archaeological work and we then stepped in post-commencement to carry out a mitigation stage of excavation on the site as they started building the projects around us where they could. So this really went off the rails from an archaeological perspective and from a schedule for the development because then of course that's got all penalty clauses built into it for the, um, for the developers and the, from the various contractors that had to be delayed, the extra cost of more excavation. And when you look at the gaps in this sequence, there's several years at several points in here where further archaeological work could be done and wasn't. Now, it did also go through several different developers as well during this project. So it had broader problems with it than just the archaeology as well. But that caused then a catalogue of problems. And I think this is where... Um, the problems start lying within the written schemes of investigation because they were in every step of this project it was reactive and not proactive. And so the every and then also the delays in the project, I think, and the fact that effectively you're looking at multiple WSIs for different specific stages of the prog program rather than one considering the whole concept of the project on the site. So it all starts with a poor evaluation reporting effectively. Um, it wasn't, and this is where the oversight of the WSI was probably not enforced, in that it was a very low percentage evaluation for an urban space, it only evaluated 4% of the site, which wasn't adequate. There was large areas of it 
that were um, not trenched for whatever reasons, access or, or other things still standing on them. It was carried out by a unit unfamiliar with Leicester's archaeology who misinterpreted the stratigraphic sequence and um, the archaeological significance therefore was inadequately characterised and so therefore then there wasn't adequate oversight from the city level then on, on that archaeological unit. That then caused a triggering effect that led to a misleading impact statement because at this point the, the consultancy was believing that the archaeology was two metres below the ground whereas in reality they'd misidentified medieval or well, Roman soil stratigraphic soil sequences as Roman medieval garden soil and therefore it was getting ignored. So now the consultancy is saying okay everything is below two metres below the ground so the only thing that's going to impact on the archaeology is the piles themselves not the pile caps whereas in reality um, it was high and the piling caps were actually going to impact the Roman archaeology. That also consultancy had a too literal interpretation of the impact of the site. It considered the impact as literally just where the pile was drilling through the ground and not the spaces between the piles when they were closely spaced together. So it underestimated the impact of, on the, on the archaeology. And then primarily there was this huge then communication failure at all aspects of the project between the developer, between the archaeological consultant and between the planning authority as well, who were all culpable in some varying degree to that collapsing communication. And it all stemmed down to a fact that there was just this absolute project design failure in this project. It was and this might not have been helped by the fact that it was such a long drawn out project. But the evaluation was triggered by the demolition of the building, not the design of the new building. And at no point then was there a collaboration between archaeologists in the design process to try and actually mitigate the damage on the archaeology. So all of this was not built into the project from the beginning. And every time a WSI was written, it was because it was a requirement of the planning application to submit it, not as a preemptive thought about how can we reduce um, the impact on the archaeology or better um, understand the archaeology. And so that had significant consequences for the archaeology. In the end, there was le very limited archaeological mitigation allowed because it had to come down to a compromise at the last minute between the developer and the city archaeologist in negotiation. And so only 600 square metres of a 7,500 square metre area was excavated. Most of the site, including two Roman buildings, was completely ignored and missed off. So there was unknown damage then ultimately to the underlying archaeology from the piling grid and from the piling caps. The archaeology, um, because the archaeology was not below the level of the caps as suggested by the impact statement. And I was trying to come up with a way of comparing the two sites um, for this. And so I sort of costed it out. And the overall cost of the archaeology for here, so in reality, it was only 600 square metres investigated. So that was 8% of the development area. And that cost, um, because it was last minute archaeological mitigation, um, that cost £300,000, um, effectively, because we were stepping in and could charge anything we liked at that point because they were desperate. Um, Additional cost for the four-month construction delay was another £200,000. So that failure of project design ultimately cost, and we don't know what the cost of the consultancy and the evaluation and all the archaeological work that preceded us was, uh, over half a million pounds just because of a poor project design. And ultimately it might have been more than that. Um, that was the bits I could work out. So that ultimately then, and we've been talking about what the WSIs talk about in them in terms of what they're asking us to protect and communicate. This failed to adequately protect, conserve and enhance the archaeology. Um, and it, it was a missed opportunity to meaning, meaningfully invest in area of, investigate an area of Leicester we don't often get a chance to investigate. In contrast, then, the High Cross, old High Cross Brewery site, similar sort of sequence of... Um, evolution on the site in that it was uh, its medieval frontage was extensively demolished in the 19th century office blocks were built on bits of it in in the uh, 1960s office blocks were demolished in the 2000s uh, the brewery was demolished in the early um sort of 2010 and the remaining buildings on the site were cleared in 2014 
So effectively, it had become an empty open site before development, exactly the same as the Southgate Brewery. We had these two open areas um, from the Southgate's bus depot. But in this instance, the developer, before he'd even designed his building, came to us to ask us to start investigating the archaeological impact that any building might have and what that repercussion would be for his development. So all of this was carried out pre-application effectively, um, but in collaboration with the city archaeologist. So in 2012 then, we carried out an initial evaluation of the site and an impact assessment of the site um, before he'd even designed his building, or he had early design stages effectively. Um, we identified there was significant well-preserved Roman and medieval archaeology on the site, as, as you'd expect in Leicester. We even found a Roman mosaic on the site, which was one of the first we'd sort of been found in Leicester for the um, um, largest bit found in sort of the last 30 years or so. We then, he gave us his preliminary building designs and we used those then come up with the impact assessment for that early stage. In 2014, then after more buildings had been cleared from the site, we moved back in and evaluated the last bits that we hadn't previously evaluated. And in doing so, we updated the impact assessment as well. In 2016, he, he sort of had consultation with the city council about what he was proposing and had basically chucked his entire building design out and come up with a new one. And so we then redid the impact assessment based on the new building footprint. And then we carried out a two month strip plan and sample excavation of the entire building footprint. And again, this is all pre-application to identify specifically um, but with a WSI agreed by the city archaeologist, I should say. So this was all done pre-condition, but was not um, was done in collaboration. Um, the idea here was to work out exactly what archaeology was beneath the building footprint, so that the building, that the structural engineers could design a building footprint, a foundation plan that would minimise the amount of archaeology that would need to be excavated. Effectively, excavating 100% excavating this site was not cost effective for the development that was going up on it. So we needed to come up with a way of mitigating the amount of money he was going to spend on the archaeology whilst also coming out with something meaningful, obviously. He then submitted his planning application for the construction of, of the development, um, which was uh, mid mixed residential and commercial development. The other one was student accommodation, by the way. Um, he and this is the one this is now the planning application is in but we're still carrying out work predetermination he agreed with the city archaeologist for a further three months of mitigation excavation and a post excavation program and all of that was wrapped up and dealt with in, in contracts with us before the planning application was determined and so actually ultimately when it came out in 2017 there were no archaeological conditions on on the site left anymore anyway because we'd already done all of the work now that's quite probably quite unusual in, in many respects how that was done. And that was done because it was a very proactive developer who wanted to um, recognize that he potentially had a very big problem with the archeology span on the site. And the only way he could actually cost effectively do this was go through this process. In contrast, then we carried out a almost 20% evaluation of the site during the evaluation stage. Um, much better at identifying and characterizing the archaeology than the 4% of the previous excavation. And I have a feeling that previous excavation, something fell through in the gain in the design process and, and the, the sort of monitoring of the site. I think they didn't finish the evaluation. I think they were meant to go back and do more trenching and it never happened. It fell through the cracks. Every time he changed his plan because the city council didn't like the previous building he designed um, in sort of informal consultation, the footprint, he shared that with us. So we were working from the very inception of the project in collaboration with his architects and his structural engineers. So we were having that backwards and forwards conversation from the very beginning. Which meant, of course, we then create an archaeology informed piling solution for the project. And that was able to then, because we've carried out a strip map and sample excavation, we could 100% guarantee that the piling cap was not going to impact any archaeology. We could also then devise a strategy and effectively we identified three aspects to the site. Um, and this was a piling grid that would only disturb about 3% of the footprint, but in areas um, 
it was treated as impact where you have like a set of five piles together, the whole area of those five piles would be included, not just the pile itself. So um, it also identified previous disturbances on the site and what that had already destroyed unknowingly into what would be left as well. And so we were able to come up with three things. In most areas of the site, we carried out no further archaeological work. We'd identified most of it was medieval pitting. That medieval pitting through sample excavation had gone down through the Roman archaeology into the natural ground. And any piles into those areas would still leave those areas interpretable in the future. There were some areas where pile positions were adjusted specifically to miss significant archaeology. Roman walls were left in situ by moving piles because at this point in the design process, this was still all adjustable. It wasn't fixed. It wasn't a fixed plan where you turn up on site and they can maybe move it 10 centimetres or something. But this was all still negotiable where these piles went. So we spaced out pile clusters so they were further apart. We moved a few to avoid walls. And then finally, there were some areas where there was complex archaeology that would be destroyed or left uninterpretable in the future. And that led to more detailed areas of excavation. So from an archaeological point of view, it wasn't a perfect solution, but it was a good compromise in gaining new information on the area and then protecting everything else under the building. And the mosaic, where it was agreed, would be lifted and conserved for future display as well. It helped it was on the corner of a building that just could not move, but it, uh, that was a selling point to the developer. But it was a selling point as a protecting the heritage and actually having a lasting legacy of lifting it and conserving it as well. So that then allowed us to create a little film about how you lift and conserve mosaics as well and leaves us a lasting um, bit of rather horrible mosaic, but it's mosaic, it's, I'm claiming it regardless. But it is, um, it's not necessarily something that will ever go on display in the museum, but potentially it's something that could go back on display at some point temporarily or could be worked into the development in future or something like that and have on display back in its actual context. It also became a case study in Historic England's um, updated piling and archaeology guidance. It created that outreach as well. We did do some outreach on site. It helped. We were being overlooked by John Lewis's cafe, so we were kept getting staff cafe, so we kept getting people coming around going, we've been watching you for days. What are you doing? So, but that allowed us then to actually feed into that, and we did do some site tours uh, and other aspects like that as well. So effectively, we ended up coming out with a meaningful and cost-effective um, project. And again, I costed it up um, as a comparison. So in this instance, we looked at the strip map and sample excavation looked at 41% of the site and 81% of the building footprint compared to the, what was it, 8% of the previous site for a cost of £175,000 compared to over half a million, effectively. So uh, for considerable more information gained from the site as well. It preserved archaeology beneath the ground in, in, as where it could for future study. As I said, it created future displays and outreach. It created a historic England case study. And it, this was only made possible by good prior information, so that high percentage evaluation, yes. But it was really here, the regular communication between us, the contractor, the developer, their architects, um, their structural engineers, and the city archaeologists from the outside. Set. So we deliberately set out as a collaborative project to design a project that would work for everybody. And it also helped that we had a developer willing to collaborate in that attitude as well, of course, and we don't always get those. Um, this was again the difference. The previous case study was a London-based firm. This was a Leicester-based firm. So they were invested in their own city more perhaps um, or had a better understanding of what they were getting into perhaps than the other firm. So I think coming back to the hindrance and help and this is where I, I think it's worth a conversation about where WSIs fit into it. Are WSIs just purely a methodological statement on how the work that you've already been told what the work is, is carried out, or should they be a broader project design that comes in much earlier in the process? Because 
um, I think Matt mentioned it, quite often you get WSIs because um, the developer sees it as a condition, they get the WSI in as quickly as possible before it's perhaps been thought out as a project and actually how it's going to help. But perhaps it should actually be being encouraged to be thought about earlier on in the process through other aspects of the construction sector and through architects perhaps um, where it's actually considered from the ground up that you actually build it in as a design element of the project that then feeds into a technical statement on how the work's going to be carried out, which can be submitted later on. But because it appears that the WSI is the planning condition, effectively that is saying that all archaeological work is in that, that document. That is the project design for the archaeological work, and actually bits of it should probably be being encouraged to be thought about much earlier on in the process. And I think that it's that early communication that's that's key. It, I mean, anything pre-application is critical. I think it provides all parties with better understanding of what the buried environment is. It creates early awareness of the presence and the significance of the subsurface heritage aspects. It enables timely archaeological aided um, design solutions and mitigation. Um, but that, with that design solution first in mind, perhaps, I know I'm talking myself out of a job in some ways here, and I'm saying we shouldn't dig it, but, and it allows, therefore, better protection and conservation of, and enhancement of our heritage aspects, because, again, it allows you to build in all of those other engagement aspects to the project as well. Because if you've got time to think about how you're going to do that, then you've got time to implement it rather than again reacting. And I think our WSIs, as we do them at the minute, tend to be too reactive and not proactive enough. And two horrible buildings now stand in their place. So, so anyway, thank you. <laughs>